Good morning everyone and thank you for joining us for our online church service this morning. Uh, last week would have been our annual community week at church and every day if you've been there in the past is packed out in the morning with young kids to the teenagers in the afternoon and then some events on at night but of course this didn't happen like it normally would unfortunately this year. However we did have some activities for the teenagers um, including weeding and helping out our local primary schools um, and going down to Crawfordsburn Beach and doing some litter picking there. So a big thank you on behalf of uh, the church here and for the schools that have, um, the young people have helped this past week. This week at Scrabble, um, on Tuesday we have our Thought for the Week um, and that will be available on all our media platforms, so on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. Our prayer meeting is on again on Wednesday evening at 8pm and this is via Zoom and in church. Um, if you're wanting to attend physically down here at Scrabble, then you will have to register um, your attendance online. And then next Sunday, God willing, again we will have our Kids Quest at 11am, followed by our Sunday service at half 11, both uh, of which will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, the elders and deacons have been making arrangements for Sunday services to be coming back into church and there will be more information hopefully on that soon. So please continue to check the website on our different social media accounts for any updates there. And if we can be of any help to you, uh, please get in touch through any of the contact details that are on the screen now. This morning Glenn Johnson is going to be doing our children's talk and then he will be continuing our series in John's Gospel. Caroline Hamilton will be coming to lead us in two praise pieces. And then this morning we will finish with a time um, to remember the Lord as we take communion. And that will be led by Campbell Brown. Right now I am just going to pray and then we'll continue with the rest of our service. Dear Lord, we just thank you for another Sunday morning here at Scrabble. Lord, we thank you that we can meet virtually like this. And Lord, we praise you that um, we have been able to continue our online services throughout this whole pandemic. And Lord, we praise you for the people who maybe have tuned in to these services, who maybe can't get here in person or just wouldn't have ten attended church before. And Lord, we ask that um, you would just stir that up, stir your word up in, in the homes of um, the families listening here today. Lord, we thank you that as we look into the future, we can maybe see the end of this pandemic in sight. And Lord, we just thank you that and there's even talks of coming back together um, in person again, Lord. And we, we are very much looking forward to that, Lord, and we praise you for that potentially happening in the near future. So Lord, we ask that you bless this Sunday to us. We ask that you would um, prepare Glenn's heart and, and pray that, Lord, he would have something to say to us um, this morning. Um, and we ask that you just bless it to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. For those of you who live your life online or exposed to a lot of social media, a lot of things on the internet, you will find that fads, things that come and go, are a lot more popular. So for example, this one, which has sort of come and gone the last lot of years, the good old bottle flip where you try and spin the bottle and get it to land, is a fad that has come and gone. Oh, maybe you're now thinking, oh, he's done the dab. That's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. That's not the dab anymore. Maybe it's this instead, the good old floss and... There's so many fads, things that lots of people do, and then all of a sudden they disappear and something new comes along. So a couple of years ago, in almost every primary school uh, all around the Arts Peninsula that I've been in, I can see almost every child have one of these little things, a fidget spinner. I haven't seen one for a couple of years because it's a fad that has come and gone. People were playing with them, using them, and now it's sort of, well, that's last year, you don't worry about that anymore. And it got me thinking about this little thing, this is not a fidget spinner. This is one of the original spinners. It's a Coca-Cola spinner. And when I was growing up, this was the equivalent of the fidget spinner of the day. So lots of people had them. The reason it's called a spinner because it goes down to the bottom, it spins and then comes back up again. So you could do all sorts of tricks with it. You could do walk the dog where it's spun at the bottom. You could do loop the loop. There's one that was really, really difficult where you sort of spun at the gap and it's called rock the baby. You got it to go up in between. So that was a big, big fad. In my day, most Saturday afternoons in the local shopping centre, uh, lots of people were all gathered round and if you could do 10 tricks, you could win a gold Coca-Cola spinner. But I haven't seen one of those for, well, I'll not tell you how long. So all these sort of fads, they come and go, they're really, really popular, particularly in our modern age. And then next week there'll be a new one and the week after that there'll be a new one again. I remember having a conversation with someone not very long ago and they were suggesting that actually the Bible is a wee bit like that. So it's a book 
that's not really relevant today. It's something that was relevant for, well, maybe when you were a child or maybe four generations ago, but it's not really relevant today. And people view the Bible as being outdated, maybe a bit of a fad and certainly not relevant in our day. I couldn't disagree more than that. And let me just use each of these five letters that make up the word Bible to try and relate something of that to you. So the first B makes me think of belief. And actually the Bible calls for belief. It calls for faith. Whether or not you believe that God exists, whether or not you believe that God made this world that we live in, whether he made us, he made us for relationship with him, that Jesus had to come and die on a cross, we have to be forgiven if we want to be back in relationship with God. And it calls for belief. And some people say, do you know what? I don't believe that. That's a bit of a fairy tale. I'm not interested in that. And they try and remove that aspect of what the Bible teaches. The I makes me think of instruction. And among many other things, the Bible is a book of instructions. Instructions as to how to live, how to treat one another, how to care for one another, how to treat this world that God has made. And people say, do you know what? I don't need those instructions. I know perfectly well how to live for myself. The second B makes me think of belong. And one of the messages of the Bible is that we can belong. We can be a child of God. We can belong to the church. We can be part of the family of God. And people will say, I don't want to belong to that. I belong to lots of other things that actually are more important to me. And they try and get rid of that. The L makes me think of love. Ultimately, the Bible is a book of love. The love that God has for us through his son, Jesus, and how we are called to love others. And people will say, do you know what? I'm not interested in that. I don't need that love. Thank you very much. And then the last E makes me think of everyone. And the message of the Bible is it's for everyone. And people say, well, it's not for me. I'm not interested in that. And what people have tried to do, unfortunately, is this message, this great, great message of truth and hope that's contained in the Bible. They've tried to get rid of that, to remove it, say it's not relevant. But there's a verse in the Bible and this is what it says. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. The Bible is an everlasting book. It's not a fad. It's something that's relevant today. It's something that's relevant every day. And I hope in these moments when maybe you have more time to read the Bible and listen to the Bible, you'll appreciate that. And there's another beautiful verse in the Psalms, and it says, From everlasting to everlasting, God is love. His love is not a fad. It's not something that's just for yesterday or last week or just for today. It's something that is new every single day. And in this world where there'll be a new fad next week and something the week after, I hope you will appreciate that you can trust the everlasting word of God, the Bible, and the everlasting message of the Bible, that there is a God in heaven who loves you and his son who died for you. Isn't it amazing that we can come before a holy God a God whose ways aren't our ways and sometimes ways that we just don't understand. He is the fountain of mercy, of truth and of love and someone who we can actually trust and just come before his holiness um, and just be before him, our holy God. So let's enjoy that as, as we worship together.
This morning's reading is from John chapter 10, verses 22 to 42. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of, God, word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside. What about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Thank you to Ruth for reading the uh verses that we're going to consider this morning from John chapter 10. There was a Native American uh, and his friend and they were in downtown Manhattan in New York. It was rush hour, so it's all the normal noises you associate with a big city at rush hour. There was traffic, uh, there were sirens, horns blurring, just a hubbub of being in a very, very busy town. And as they were walking along the pavement, the Native American stopped and he said to his friend, I can hear a cricket. And his friend looked at him and says, you're crazy. You couldn't possibly hear anything over the noise of all the stuff that's going on. He says, no, no, I definitely hear a cricket. And they walked a little bit further and the Native American walked to the side of the footpath where there was a concrete planter with different sort of shrubs and bushes growing out of it. And he pulled back some of the leaves and pointed in. And there in the middle of it was a cricket. His friend was astounded and he said, you must have supersonic hearing. And the guy says, no, no, my ears are just the same as yours. It depends what you're listening to. He says, that can't be the case. How on earth did you hear that? I couldn't possibly hear it. And he reiterated and says, no, it, it just depends what's important to you, what you're listening to. And the illustrator, he put his hand in his pocket and he brought out some coins. He put them down onto the footpath and every head within about 10 or 15 feet turned around to see if they had dropped their coins. And he said again, you see, it just depends what your ears are tuned into what's important to you. We live in a world which is craving our attention at every turn, a world full of distraction and noise. And we'll see from this passage that Ruth read to us this morning that Jesus had spoken clearly and shown clearly exactly who he was. If you want to know who Jesus really is, I would encourage you to look closely at his works and listen very carefully to his voice. The context for this passage this morning, verse 1 says, the feast of dedication. At the end of the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, there's a period of about 400 years. It's sometimes referred to as the silent years because there's nothing recorded 
in the scriptures and the Bible about it. But of course, history just wasn't on pause. There was lots of stuff going on which is recorded in history. And one thing relevant to the Jewish nation, a brutal Assyrian king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes had attacked Jerusalem and killed thousands of Jews. His mindset was to eradicate the Jewish worship and to usher in the worship of Zeus. It was a time of extreme difficulty for the nation of Israel, for the nation, uh, the Jewish nation. And then a Jewish revolutionary by the name of Judas Maccabeus created a rebellion, saved the Jewish nation and re-established the true worship that they had enjoyed as a nation. There followed an act of rededication of the temple and part of that the people lit lights all around their homes and put it in their windows. It was called the Feast of Dedication as is mentioned here in verse 22 of John chapter 10. It's also referred to as the Festival of Lights because of the lights that they put around their homes are more commonly known as Hanukkah. And it was during this festival, this feast, that Jesus came to Jerusalem. And you'll notice at the end of verse 22, John adds the little detail, it was winter, November or December. But interestingly, that's not just a description of the time of the year. It's also a very good description of the state of the relationship between the Jewish nation and Jesus. No life, cold, dark and dead. Not a vibrant living faith, but dead religion. Heidi was sharing these verses with me from Jeremiah chapter 17 this week. And it's a really good description of the dead faith of many of the Jews, sadly. And these, this is what these verses say. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Sadly, that's what many of the Jews were doing and what these Jewish leaders were encouraging them to do, put their faith in them, mere men. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. Dead faith, tick box religion. Verse 24 says the Jews gathered around Jesus. When you read through the Gospels in the Bible, for his whole ministry, people gathered around Jesus. They flocked to him. Time and again, crowds of people were drawn to him to seek help and also to listen to him. There's many, many accounts of crowds following Jesus and being in the presence of Jesus. But here it says the Jews gathered around him. The idea is pressing in. It was aggressive and confrontational. And they challenged him with this statement. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Later on in John's Gospel, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. That's a staggering truth on its own right. The things that we see recorded of Jesus are amazing, but John says there's many other things that are not even recorded. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. Up until this point in John chapter 10, Jesus had changed water into wine. Healed an official son from about 10 miles away by just speaking. Healed a man at the pool of Bethesda who had been an invalid for 38 years. Fed 5,000 plus with two loaves or two fish and five loaves. Walked on water. Healed a man born blind. But the miracles of Jesus... They weren't his primary purpose for coming to the world. They were signposts pointing to who he was and why he had came. In Luke 4 verse 43, after Jesus had performed other miracles, he healed many, many people. The people in the village encouraged him to stay. And Jesus said this to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And what is that good news? Messiah had come. God had come to this world to redeem it. And because of that, we aren't left with the option of acknowledging that Jesus was a good man, although he was, or a miracle worker, although he performed many miracles, or a great teacher, which of course he was, or someone that drew people to him, which he did, of course. He's not just someone we align our thinking to. It's not the same as liking a Facebook post or sharing or reposting a page. Jesus Christ is the very creator God in the flesh come to this world. Verse 30, Jesus said, I and the, and the Father are one. There's a beautiful passage in Philippians 2. 
and it talks about the reality of who Jesus is. It says, though he was in nature God, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself as nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him, and at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God of God the Father. What a step of humility. The very creator God coming in the form of a man, Jesus, to this world in order to redeem it, in order to pay the price for our sin. History is full of men who wanted to be God's small g, but only one God, in fact, the only true God who chose to become a man. There are numerous examples of people bowing before Jesus when you read through the Gospels. People flat on their faces in acknowledgement of who he was, the very son of God. But the Jewish leaders, as they come and press in now on Jesus, stand bolt upright with their heads held high and their chests puffed out. They had made their mind up. They were completely blind to the truth and reality of who was standing right in front of them. And as they journeyed through their life, they completely ignored the signposts that were pointing to Messiah. And when they asked Jesus to tell them plainly, Jesus replied, verse 25, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. Their eyes and ears were tuned into everything going on around them, but completely blind and deaf to the very one standing right in front of them. Last year, I was invited by Queen's um, University Christian Union to speak at an event that they were hosting. Uh, So about 300 students, they were having a table quiz and then they'd asked me to bring a message at the end. And I remember getting the email and it asked me to speak on the following topic. What is the meaning of life, the universe and everything else? And they allocated me 15 minutes, quite a challenge. The content of my message in a sense was very simple. It was the reality that the meaning of life is based on the fact that there is a creator God who made this world, who made us for meaning and purpose that we disobeyed him. And as a result of him, as a result of that, he sent his son Jesus, the son of God, to the world to die on a cross, to be punished for our sin, to rise again so that we can know him, know relationship with him through the Holy Spirit. And we discover our purpose and meaning in life by putting our trust in Jesus and having our broken relationship restored and to live out our lives with faith in Jesus as our saviour, and our Lord. And as I was speaking, behind me on the screen, uh, there was a mobile number that they had posted and people were invited during the talk to text in questions based on what I was speaking to them about. And as soon as I finished, the host came up and started to give me the questions. And I tried the very best to answer them. But as it started, I said to them, and it wasn't a cop out, I said that even though I believe there's overwhelming evidence for the existence of God as creator and for Jesus, And there's overwhelming evidence in the lives of people who have been radically transformed through that and found meaning and purpose. Ultimately, it's a matter of personal faith. We need to decide. It's not a blind leap of faith. Jesus replied to the Jews here, I did tell you, I did show you. I believe the evidence is overwhelming, but individuals need to assess it for themselves and make an informed decision and exercise personal individual faith for yourself. A little aside that I was challenged by, the Jews who consistently confronted Jesus were supposed to be leading the nation. And as a husband and as a father, my responsibility is to lead in my home and to encourage my wife and my children to follow Christ. And to my shame, I don't do that well a lot of the time. And I was personally challenged by that this week. And maybe that's a challenge to you as well, as a Christian husband, father, And let me encourage you to really look into your own heart and examine where you are with that and to fix that if you need to do so. Jesus said, verse 30, I and the Father are one. He was claiming to be God. Make no mistake about that. And their reaction to this was that they picked up stones to stone him. The choice was simple, I suppose. Accept Jesus for who you claim to be or else kick 
and revile against the truth. They chose the latter. Whenever Jesus radically changed that man at the pool of Bethesda who had been 38 years invalided, the Jewish leader's focus wasn't on salvation and transformation. It was on laws and regulations. And that continued in their encounters with Jesus. Verse 33. They looked at God in the flesh and reduced him to a mere man. And as I said at the start, we're not left with that option. You cannot accept Jesus as a good teacher a miracle worker. He claimed to be God in the flesh. So either he is that, or as C.S. Lewis famously put it, he's either mad or he's bad. And you need to make a choice on that yourself. But if we accept him as God in the flesh, then our lives are completely changed forever and must be completely changed forever. And our security is in him. Verses 28 through 30 have got some tremendous truths and comforts for us. And no matter what, his grip on us is secure. I was reading in the little book of Jude, the penultimate book of the Bible, just before Revelation. And I've been enjoying it over the last number of weeks. There's only 26, 27 verses, something like that in it. But it's packed full of truth and comfort and challenge and meaning. And it starts off, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. I just love that phrase, kept by Jesus Christ. At a camp many, many years ago, an EBR camp, uh, we stayed up on the north coast and we went, to, we went to Ballantoy Harbour. Some of you will have been there. You know the wee windy road you come down, there's a beautiful little harbour. Well, if you go back up the road a bit and go down onto the beach and round to the right, there's a huge big rock face. It's about 200 feet high. And we went abseiling. And someone from the police came along and they took us through some abseiling. I hate heights. It was terrifying. And for me to stand and to lean back over a 200 feet drop, just holding on to a rope, would have been absolutely crazy. And the only thing that gave me comfort was the reality that the, the guy who was doing the abseil, because it was wrapped around in a certain way, even if I slipped or let go of the rope, he still had me. He was holding me. I wasn't going to come to any harm at all. Christ holds us. What a beautiful picture. He holds us. We're in his grip. We're secure when we come to know him. Irrespective of what goes on, some of you this week will have got A-level results and AS results. Some of you will be ecstatic. Some of you disappointed and confused. If you surrender fully to Christ, you can be sure he holds you. He has a purpose. He has a plan for your life. It may not be what you thought, but please let me encourage a young person, trust him. Put your faith in him. After they tried to stone Jesus at this claim of being co-equal with God, he escaped their grasp and left them. And that's a very sobering thought, actually. And let me just encourage you, be very careful that you don't harden your heart. Whenever Jesus speaks to you, maybe he has been over a number of weeks through these online services. And maybe this morning he's speaking clearly to you. Don't harden your heart. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says this. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But one day he will come back and it'll be too late to make a decision. So let me encourage you, don't push Jesus away now. Draw him close, surrender your heart and your life to him. Jesus left the hardened hearts of the Jewish leaders and went back again to the fertile hearts of the people in Galilee where many had previously believed in him. Caroline and the priest team are going to lead us in a song. It's the creed. It's based on the statements of faith of the early followers of Christ. And let me encourage you, if you know this song and the truth of this song in your living rooms or wherever you're watching this this morning or at whatever time you're watching, sing this out with gusto. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. These are great truths. And they're truths that will completely and radically transform your life if you allow them to, and if you accept them, and if you live by them. So sing it out. And if you don't know him this morning, allow the words to act as signposts for you. As you listen to these statements that are sung, they're signposts pointing you to the reality that the very creator God came to this world in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, hung on a cross, was punished freely for your sin and my sin, and longs for us to accept that and to live for him. Longs to be our good shepherd, our guide. 
longs to lead us, guide us, direct us, longs to give us life to the full, life of fulfillment and purpose. And let me encourage you to drown out the noise all around you that clambers for your attention and tune your ears to the very voice of God even in these final moments this morning and surrender your heart to him and give your life to him. The God who became man. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The word Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's a great truth and I would encourage you to accept it and live by it. I'm just going to pray briefly and then we're going to enjoy this beautiful song, I Believe in God the Father. Thank you for tuning in again and I pray God's richest blessing on your life and encourage you to surrender fully and completely to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you that Jesus Christ came to this world. Thank you that he is the very son of God. He is the very God in the flesh come to this planet that was created by him and he came to redeem it and to restore it and we thank you for that. And as we now listen or sing this beautiful song of great truth, for those of us who, that know you, I pray that our hearts will be stirred again to follow you and live for you. And for people this morning or this evening or this afternoon, whenever they're tuning into this message, who don't know you, Lord, speak to them clearly. Give them the courage to surrender their hearts, to say sorry for their sin to acknowledge that you are the very creator God, to trust Christ as Saviour Lord, to invite him into their hearts as Saviour Lord and Master, and to live for you and to surrender fully to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share again from the powerful life-changing word of God. And I pray you'll take it and use it for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Well, it's really good that we can declare out what we believe and who we believe in. It's a good reminder for ourselves and it admonishes each other. Um, this song says, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. It says, I believe in the name of Jesus. Let's try and sing that together. Holy 
verses of scripture that has been a blessing to many people over the ages has been John 3 verse 16 and this verse says for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life begins with for God so loved the world and what God did, he just demonstrated that love by giving that which was most precious to him, that is his son, the Lord Jesus, to be a sacrifice for us. God took on flesh and not only did he show us the very nature of God, he walked among us in full obedience to his father's will, knowing that he would be rejected knowing that he would suffer on the cross and knowing that he would take our sin though he himself was sinless and die on the cross so that the penalty for our sin would be taken so we might not perish but have everlasting life you know, we take these emblems today just to Help us just to remember that sacrifice, just to remember that his death has brought us life. His death has brought us eternal life. And it gives us as an opportunity just to consider and to reflect and to give thanks to him even now for his death. So if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus as your own and personal saviour, if you believe in him, then you're welcome to participate at home and take these emblems and just give thanks to the Lord Jesus for all that he has done for you. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of love. And I thank you that that love was demonstrated in the provision of your son. You gave him willingly to be a sacrifice for our sin. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came and you were obedient to your father's will. I thank you that you suffered upon a cross for my sake and for each of our sakes, that you took the penalty of our sin that you took that upon your body as the nails were driven into your hands and your feet upon that cross. Oh Lord, we want to thank you now. Thank you for the salvation you give to us. Thank you that you give us new life. And I thank you that just for all that you have done and are doing in our lives. Amen.
Jesus, we thank you that when you hung on the cross, your blood was shed. And we thank you that by the shedding of your blood, we have forgiveness for our sin. We thank you that it is total, that it is complete. I thank you that nothing has to be added to it, nor anything can be taken away. I thank you for the salvation we have through this, your blood. Amen. Thanks again for joining with us for our service this morning at Scrabble. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope you've been encouraged by what we've heard from Glenn. Just a reminder to keep in touch through social media, through Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. And if you need any help, please contact us through our website, www.scrabble.org. Just to end our service, I'm going to pray. Father, thank you for this time that we've shared together this morning. And that even during this time, we can still meet in this way and come and give you thanks for what you've done for us. We give thanks for the message that Glenn has shared and we just pray that we'll all be challenged and encouraged by it. Help us as we go into this week to remember that you're a God who is with us and a God who is in control. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.